All right, well, let me ask you a question. What difference does the resurrection of Jesus make? And we become the, maybe you got dragged here by an aunt or an uncle or your grandparents or your spouse or somebody like, I, I'll go to church with you, but I really don't want to go. I've been there too, by the way. And like, what's the big deal about Easter? Every year it's the same old thing. Yeah, he rose from the dead. That's great, wonderful. I guess it happened, but whatever. What difference does it make in my life? And I have to encourage you to let you know it makes a huge difference in your life. If you will understand the significance of what it means that Jesus rose again from the dead. And we're going to look at a life of somebody in the Bible who tried to follow Jesus, failed absolutely miserably, and was restored. So we're going to look at that, his Easter story, from the eyes of Peter, the apostle. And so that's what we're going to look at today. But how many of you have ever done this before? Lord, I'll never do that again. Never. I'm done. One and done. I'm done. I got the t-shirt. I even burned the t-shirt. I'm not doing that again. I swear to you, I'll never do that again. I'll never drink like that again. I'll never go with a person like that again. I will never spend like that again. I'll never do that again. I remember a friend of mine, he bought a sports car. As soon as he got out of college and he was going into debt, he had to sell it. Because he's like, I don't know why I keep buying stuff. I said, well, stop buying stuff. <laughs> so maybe you struggle with that. Maybe you struggle with all sorts of, we all got something, right? Let's be honest. And there's been a number of times I said, Jesus, that's it. God, I'm not doing that again. And what, is it, what happens? And you do it again. How many in this room never had that problem? Raise your hand. Wow, that's amazing. One person, I, I tell you, I, I've only fallen maybe... I struggled maybe once or twice, actually too many times to count, right? We've all struggled with things like this. Well, what do we do? How do we overcome? And what does the resurrection of Christ have to do with that? It has everything to do with us overcoming. You see, Jesus wants us to have an abundant life. The problem is we've been sold a bill of goods of what an abundant life is that's not even close to being an abundant life. You see, you're designed by God for God, as we mentioned to you. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to read the Easter story just for a few moments, and then we're going to look at Peter's life. You guys ready? All right. Here we go. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Simon brought spices that they might go and anoint him. Anoint who? Anoint Jesus. Why were they going to anoint Jesus? Let me just back up for a few moments. I never want to assume that people know exactly the story. If you're not familiar with the story, basically Jesus was born in Bethlehem, as a baby, you might have heard about it, virgin birth, right? He grew up for 30 years and lived a normal life, per se, we think, at least. Normal in the sense of his, his attributes were not known except for being a baby, a toddler, and a 12-year-old. But when he was 30 years old, he began his public ministry. He began to preach the kingdom of heaven. He basically said he was God. He had uh, disciples. He had 12 disciples. He had uh, 120 disciples. He had 500. He had large crowds, but he had his inner core. And he began to preach about the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Jewish people were under subjection to the Roman authorities. They were living under the Roman government. And at one time, they had a kingship. They had a mon monarchy. They, they used to have an amazing, amazing uh, civilization in their own country, but they lost it. And so all the, all the scriptures in the Old Testament talked about a Messiah who would come and restore the kingdom back to them again. So they're waiting, they're praying, they're hoping that God is going to bring in the Messiah. They are waiting for that Messiah. And they came up with their own theories how he's going to come back. They had their scriptures of the Old Testament. They said, okay, this is how he's going to come back. And they were hoping and praying that the Messiah would come as a conquering king on a white horse. Instead, Jesus came as a suffering servant and it came in a way that no one even expected. Even his disciples were not getting it. Sometimes, if you and I are so hell-bent on what we believe, if someone says in front of you and says, this is black, and you are convinced it's white, you'll say it's white. Because we're so, and, the, and Jesus said, I'm going to have to die and rise again. They're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. We're going to come back and take the kingdom. They did not get it. Finally, Jesus wrote in last week, we talked about that, and he said he was the son of God. We had the religious groups did not like him. There were two types of religious groups back in those days, kind of like today. You had the ultra right-wing conservative conspiracy theorists, <laughs> Pharisees, right? They were, they were against everything that moves. 
And they had their own entourage, and they were very uh, popular with the Jewish people. They were a conservative church. There were good Pharisees and bad Pharisees. Then you had the Sadducees, who didn't believe in spiritual things. They didn't believe in resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. So you had the Sadducees, and both of them were, were, were really upset about Jesus because he was dis disrupting their power struggle because the religious elites had more money, had clout, had special privileges. If they kept the people at bay, the Romans would be happy and give them accolades. So here's Jesus. Who's this guy, Jesus, preaching a gospel different than a, a story different than they believe in because they want a conquering king and they were threatened by him. And because he said he was the son of God and he was God himself, they found a way to falsely accuse him, but then, they, then Jesus finally said, yes, I am the king. And they put him on the cross because of the Romans tried to bring peace. Pontius Pilate put him on the cross, gave the edict to put him on the cross. He died on the cross, and then he was buried in a tomb. Now, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, heard Jesus say, he, always, he said in three days he'll rise, so we better put guards around the tomb and seal it. What's so interesting is, those that were far from God knew it better than his own disciples. His own disciples were distraught. They thought that was the end. So now we come to the situation. So the ladies want to bring the spices to Jesus. And by the way, it's, it's, it's amazing because it's Mary Magdalene, who the Bible says seven demons were cast out of her. Mary, the mother of James, brought the spices so that they might go and anoint him. That's the body of Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had uh, risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who's gonna roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw the young men, a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified he has risen. He is not here. See the place where he led him. So they saw his burial cloths. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, which is significant, why they're telling the disciples and Peter. You're going to see in a few moments. But before we go any further here, I always find it interesting. People say, well, you know, Christianity, it's kind of like uh, Johnny Appleseed. The guy planted apple trees, but we blow it out of a portion. No, actually, it's very amazing. If you're going to make a false religion and make up a story, why would you choose women as your first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus? Now, I'm not saying it to be sexist. I'm saying it to the culture of the Jewish culture of that day and even the Greek and Roman culture of that day, women's uh, testimony was not admissible to the courts. So if a woman said something, it had no credibility. Why on earth, if you're gonna make up a false religion, do you use the most uncredible, if that's even a word, sources you could find, right? So it's so amazing. In fact, in fact Jesus was the greatest women liberator, even Gloria Steinem has nothing on Jesus. In fact, the first female evangelist, the first evangelist, really, in the Bible, was the woman at the well in John chapter 4. She went and told everyone about Jesus and brought people to Jesus. That's what an evangelist does. The first people to see Jesus when he rose from the dead were women, not the men. That's like huge. Basically, Jesus saying, women, I value you. You can share the gospel. And what he's doing is he's bringing back what should be the role of women, that they are fellow heirs of Christ. You see, the culture of that day for thousands of years, man has been abusing women and pushing them down. And some of the reactions we see in our culture is a kickback from that. And now we're taking it, distorting it. But Jesus brings dignity to both men and women. Women have an amazing role as co-heirs with Christ, and so do men. So men can be men, and women can be women. It's a beautiful thing. You see, so Jesus restored everybody. No matter if you were rich, you were poor, a man, or a woman, it didn't make a difference. We were all equal before God. So the Equality Amendment was passed by Jesus, and it was not political. It was all about your spirit and your mind. So we believe that today. You all equal before God. I'm not better than you, right? 
we're just a church coming together. We want to love God together. And we're not here to tell him when to be a judge. We just want to tell you what's going to happen one day. You're going to have to face God. So anyhow, this happens. So, but go and tell his disciples and Peter. Now, why do they sell tell Peter for it? Well, the story of Peter is very interesting. Peter was a disciple. He was a fisherman. He was from Galilee, which is kind of like the back home, West Virginia, uh, Mississippi. You know, he talked like this a little bit. Hey, how are you doing? You know, he probably spat tobacco and drove a pickup truck. Nothing wrong with that, okay? But he was a good old boy, okay, country boy. Or, or maybe he was from Boston. Ka, you know? You know, I grew up in Long Island, New York. He used to, hey, hey, boots, you know, hey, we're doing, you know, talk like that. So when you hear someone's accent, you can tell where they're from. Someone says, where's the car in the bar? You know, they're from Boston, right? If they say water, they're from Brooklyn, all right? So you can kind of, if they speak very sophisticated and perfect English, they're from Connecticut, all right? So, so you have the upper echelon. Here's Peter, just a fisherman. What he's doing is he's fishing. And uh, so what basically, I'll just kind of, to, to save time, I'll tell you the story. They're fishing, and they're catching no fish. They're seeing this guy, Jesus, who's preaching and doing amazing things. And Jesus sees the guys. Hey, guys, you caught anything yet? And you're like, no, we didn't caught anything. Throw it to the other side. So what does Peter do? But at your word, I will let down the nets. So they let down their nets, and the, the whole, the net began to be full of fish. They had to call more boats, and their boat started to sink. There was so much fish. So basically, they had the greatest fishing day of their life. It's like closing a hundred million deal if you're in sales. It's like hitting a grand slam at the World Series. It's like the World Cup, the NFL, uh, the, the Super Bowl, and the World Series winning it all at once. It, it was amazing. They're like freaking out. What is amazing? And then Jesus looks at Peter and says, come follow me. They drop their nets, and Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. In other words, I'm, you're going to come with me on this startup company called Christianity that wasn't even named yet. So they, they left him. For three and a half years, they followed Jesus. They learned how to flow in the power of the Spirit. They laid hands on the... Things were amazing. And then Jesus starts telling them he's going to have to die, and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And these disciples were interesting. They're kind of like church people today. You know, I want to be the most important. They had the whole thing going on, and Jesus still dealt with them. So we come to the point now, they're having, Thursday night, they're having a last supper, if you will. They didn't know it was the last supper. They're having a Passover meal together, breaking bread and all that, and Jesus starts talking to them about what's going to happen. And he basically says the following to all the disciples, including Peter. He says, then Jesus said to them, you will what? You will all fall away because of me. This night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered, will they all fall away because of you? I will never, I will never fall away. And he is genuine, he's real, and he's saying that, okay? He's saying, I'll never fall away, God. You got me. Now, what's so interesting, when Jesus says all going to fall away, what does that mean? Okay, if all fall away, then what? where's the area of human choice? So he couldn't help it? No, that's not true. How many of you have dogs? Okay. How many of you have cats? Okay. Have you noticed the cats don't have owners, they have staff? Okay. I grew up with a Siamese cat. We are Siamese, right? And this was a nasty cat. Okay? He used to bite me and hiss at me. I used to torment it, by the way. But anyhow, so we told the cat and taught the cat, sprayed water on the cat, to tell it not to jump on the counters. So the cat knew not to jump on the counters. And it obeyed when we were around. But if you went downstairs quick, you said, the cat, you'd see it on the counter. And so I knew that Susie was gonna jump on the counter. Now if any of you have cats, get, get cameras, and tell the cat not to do something, the moment you leave the house, that cat is gonna, the dog will obey. That's why dog is God backwards. Anyhow. <laughs> so the cat jumps on the counter, right? Did the cat still choose to jump on the counter? Yes. Did you know the cat was going to do it? Yes. God knew what Peter was going to do, but Peter still made the choice. You understand that? So you're not forced to do anything. God gives you free will, even though he may know what you're going to do. I'm a dog person. You're a cat person. That's okay. All right. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night, talks to Peter, 
the rooster crows, you will deny me not once, not twice, but three times in a lady. I'm sorry, once, not twice, but three times. You're going to deny me three times. Peter said to them, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. But the one, Jesus goes on, but the one who has no sword, sell his cloak and buy one. He tells them after this, buy a sword. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. That's from Isaiah 53, written 700 years before Christ. They said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said, that's enough. So what happens is, he tells them to buy a sword. He's saying it figuratively. So anyhow, they're thinking, great, we're going to kick some tail. We're going to fight the Romans. So that night, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And all of a sudden, the religious leaders come, and they're coming to arrest Jesus. Now, what did Jesus tell Peter? All going all to fall away. What did Peter say? I'm willing to die for you. What happens? Peter pulls out his sword, right? He wants to defend Jesus. He's willing to go to death for Jesus. He's willing to end his life. He's going to fight for Jesus. He pull, I'll fight for you. I'll pull out that sword. And that's what it is. So Peter drew the sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's life. Jesus heals it. And then Jesus says the following. He says, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering that the Father has given me? Now, what are you going to do? You're telling Jesus, I'm going to die for you. And you mean it. You're sincere. Now you're willing to fight and die in battle. And Jesus says, put your sword away. Would you not be a little confused? I would. So he's freaking out. What the heck is going on? What happened here? And now he's fearful, right? When you don't know what's going on and, and your life is being rocked, you get fearful. So what did he start doing? He started following Jesus from afar. He was scared. So we had the declaration. Now we have the denial. And the Nile is not just a river in Egypt, as you know. Now, in Matthew 26, 69, now Peter was sitting outside the country courtyard and a servant girl, a teenage girl, came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean, but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another teenage girl saw him, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he said, he denied it with an oath. I do not know this man. Why did a teenage girl intimidate him? Because who doesn't, I have a teenage daughter and they're intimidating. <laughs> they're intimidating. So he was intimidated by the teenage girl. And now he starts like taking an oath. I swear I do not know him. And said, he's like, I swear I do not know who he is. You know, he's speaking in a Southern accent. Well, how do I know that? Well, after a little while, the bystanders came up to Peter and said, certainly you too are one of them. You're what? Your accent gives, betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse. He dropped the F-bomb. Basically, in their, not, that's what he basically did in his society. On himself and to swear, I do not know who he is. He used the worst language he could. He invoked a curse on himself. May I be destroyed. Whatever he said, it was bad. Okay? But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed and, check this out, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Peter was following Jesus from afar. It was a courtyard, not very big. I've been to Israel, probably where that music stand is over there. And Jesus comes in and by this time, Jesus was beaten with a rod. A crown of thorns was on They're punching him. They're spitting on him. They're um, blindfolding him. Who hit you? Who hit you? Prophesy to us, Messiah. They were ridiculizing him. By the time he saw Peter, he was pretty bloody already. Can you imagine locking eyes with Jesus, blood coming down his face, eyes swollen, looking at him? How would you feel? You just denied him. You swore. You cursed. You said, may I be destroyed? And you see Jesus. How would you feel? Well, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord. He said to him, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. There was another disciple who also betrayed Christ. His name was Judas. Do not name your dog Judas, but you can name your cat Judas. <laughs> so Judas betrayed Jesus and then he felt remorse. And instead of running back to God, he listened to the enemy and he committed suicide. 
See, the enemy, well, he'll do this. He'll convince you to do something, and then when you do it, he'll condemn you to die. God's different. When you mess up, God comes looking for you to restore you, not to destroy you. If you're breathing and your heart is pounding, God wants to restore every person here. Not to restore you to brokenness and yourself, but to restore you to wholeness in him. So I want to encourage you with that today, wherever you're going through. See, we all fail, but God comes searching for us. Do you realize when man first sinned in the book of Genesis, guess what happened? God came looking for Adam to restore him, to cover him, to bring him back in fellowship. God is reaching out to you today. He loves you. You're made in his image. He's put eternity in your heart. You know there's more to life than what you're living. God is reaching out to you saying, come to me. I love you. Yeah, you blew it, but I love you. I got better days for you. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. He knows better than, than any of us. The Bible says, while we were still messed up and full of dis destruction and sin, Christ died for us. He came looking for us, us not for him. And so, remember we came back to here? Back to the cave where the women were? What happened? But go tell his disciples and Peter. Why? God was reaching out to Peter. Because Peter thought he was done. What happened next? Peter saw Jesus and all that. He saw him. But what happened was he began to struggle with his identity. I've gone too far. Now, how many of you betrayed Christ? Maybe we never betrayed Christ verbally or, you know, like through an action. Like, I deny Christ. But how many of us deny Christ with our actions? I have. I mean, you call yourself a Christian and you just did what you did? Right? We've all done it. And so we often deny our actions. How about this, everybody? I'm just going to bring some examples. You're in a restaurant. It's time to pray. All right, everyone, keep your eyes open. The coast is clear. Lord, Lord, bless this food to our bodies. Rub a dub dub. Thanks for the grub. All right? I mean, we're embarrassed to pray in, in public. Hello, right? That's a minor issue, but we often deny him how we live. And that's why some people say, You call yourself a Christian. And I tell people, I'm a flawed individual that needs a Savior just like you. So that's what happens. You can deny by your actions or by your words. So what happens is Peter, after all this takes place, Jesus raises from the dead. He sees Jesus. He's all cool, great. But he's thinking to himself, I've, I've blown it. I've gone too far, right? What does he say? I'm going fishing. So basically, Jesus found him fishing, and he's going back to his old ways. Come on, guys, let's go fishing with me. So he goes fishing. And on the shoreline, there's a man, hey guys, have you caught anything yet? They basically say, we've caught nothing at all. And so he says, cast your net to the right side. So, all right, sure, cast the net. It's Jesus. So the, uh, the whole net was full of fish. This time the net didn't break. Peter got out of the boat, swam to the shore, and Jesus had fish and chips ready for them. He had a fire, and he was feeding the disciples. And then he tells Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Jesus, you know I love you. He goes, do you love me more than all these? <sighs> yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said agape twice, which is self-sacrifice love. Peter kept saying, you know I love you, Jesus, like a brother. Jesus says the third time, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Now, why is he saying it three times? Jesus is not saying it three times for himself to humiliate, Jesus, to humili humiliate Peter. He's trying to restore Peter. He's pulling out those three, storm, three thorns of rejection. And so he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. In other words, you're going to continue in the ministry. You're going to be on this rock. I will build my church, as he told him earlier. So he says, I'm restoring you, Peter. I'm restoring you. Not once, not twice. He says, three times, I'm restoring you. Peter, I'm going to restore you. So he restores Peter. Why? Because, because of the resurrection. Now, it's something very, very interesting. He says a third time. And then he says, feed my sheep. And then he says... I want you to follow me. See, the resurrection of Jesus takes care of your failures and my failures. So then he goes on to say, hey, Peter, when you were young, you used to go where you wanted to go, but when you get old, you'll be taken to where you not want to be taken, and your hands will be stretched out. He was basically prophesying that one day Peter was going to die on the cross. 
Church history tells us that Peter was hung on a cross, and he said, I cannot be hung on a cross like Jesus. Hang me upside down. So basically what Peter did for the rest of his life, he followed Jesus closely. You see, before we saw him in the courtyard, he was following at a distance. He was following at a distance. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're following God at a distance. I'll go to church, but I won't do too much of that. You know, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. Like meatloaf, right? I'm not going to do that. Listen, my, that one thing that you will not do holds you back from God. What does Jesus say? Take up your cross and follow me. He said to him, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. So the whole trick to this whole thing, everybody, the only way this works is that you and I have to pick up the cross. What does that mean? I'm dying to myself, and I'm carrying this with me every single day. And every day something comes out of me that's not of God. I need to nail it to the cross. Lord, I nail those things. I nail that anger. I nail that frustration. I nail that unforgiveness. I nail that lust. I thank you that I am dead to that and alive to Christ Jesus. He said, if anyone would come after him, let him deny himself, right, and take up his cross daily, and what? Follow me. What he's asking you to do is to follow closely. And you follow closely by taking the cross and saying, I'm dead to myself. The only way your faith in Jesus will work is complete commitment. A hundred percent. Are you going to screw up? Yes. But get back on the horse and ride it again. Every day I come back to Christ. Every day I mess up. Every day I have to put it on the cross. So what I want to encourage you to do is pick up the cross. Are you following Jesus closely? You see, the only way to true salvation is to follow Jesus to the cross. Unless you follow him to the cross, you cannot experience resurrection. He requires it all because he gave it all. So here's the good news. The good news is you're all a wreck and so am I. There's not one that's right. That's good news? Yeah, it is good news. Do you know why? Jesus died for you and he died for me. He paid the price for us. So if you and I will give our lives to Jesus and say, God, I give my life to you. I receive you as my Lord. I, I bow down to you. I do what you say. Because don't you think the God of the universe knows a lot better than you? Some of you have kids here today. The kids want to run in the middle of the street and they think they're right, but you know better. God knows better for you. You see, one day you and I are all going to have to face God. One day you and I are all going to have to face God. And he's going to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? And there's only one reason why you can go to heaven. It's because Jesus died for your sins and paid for your sins. But he requires basically a couple things. You've got to believe he's the son of God, believe he died on the cross, and believe he rose again from the dead. I'm going to ask you to bow your head just for a second. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for this opportunity to come here today. Lord, we thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I pray right now you'd stir in our hearts. Lord, all of us, Lord, myself included, Lord, we want to follow you, not from afar. We're tired of playing games with you, God, being on church on Sunday and living differently on Monday and Saturday night. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to close the gap. We want to believe in you today, Lord. I pray you touch every person today in Jesus' name.